Um, I want to thank Shannon and I want to thank um, Passive House Accelerator. Um, this talk I'm going to give today is a slightly modified version of one that I was asked to give for um, Passive House Empire State a couple months ago by Jonathan Finewood via Ken Levinson. So um, it'll be techy, but as Shannon said, there'll be some other stuff in there too. So um, I'm going to talk about my work and my practice through the lens of sort of four things. Obviously, passive house is the is the filter that we view all these things through, and it has implement it has implications in all of them. One of them, though, is is what I call a principle guided practice. Um, and what I mean by that is a lot of us, particularly when uh, younger practitioners, whether you're a builder, whether you're an architect, you're kind of at this cusp where, well, I really want to do passive house. I really want to do high performance building. I want to do this stuff, but my clients aren't asking for it. And I found myself in that position uh, when I when I began doing the training and and I thought, well, you know, I was nimble. I had a small business and I just decided I got to just start doing these projects. And and the whole point about it, this this notion of a principle guided practice is clients are seeking uh, they're seeking leadership and they're seeking guidance. And if you wait for them to come to you and say, hey, this is what I want to do, it's going to take a long time. So at a certain point at least for me, I decided I needed to start, take take some chances and push it. So you'll hear some more about that. Um, incorporating and elementing, uh, implementing um, evolving systems, materials and technologies that obviously gets into, of course, um, high performance building techniques. It gets into embodied carbon considerations and, it, and, and some other things. And you'll see some, just some hints of that today. Predictability is a big thing for me. Um, not just um, one of the things that really drew me to high performance building and passive house in particular was the notion that, you know, designing up front and quantifying the, the, the performance goals of the building, <clears throat> excuse me, and being able to do diagnostics during construction, you know, you're not, you're not crossing your fingers saying, well, I sure hope it works out okay. I mean, you're, you're really verifying that this is going to happen. Um, and at the same time, you know, can we bring these kind of considerations to cost predictability and to scheduling predictability. So I'm gonna get into that a little bit. So uh, with that, I'm gonna move on. So principles, you're gonna hear me say that word a lot. I'm a big principle guy. Um, the one thing that I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on but I need to say goes without saying is obviously all of this is driven by the, by the goals uh, and the aspirations of clients. And so those are, those are things that, that need to be worked out you know, super early in the process. And to be sure, particularly when you're talking about um, uh, environmentally uh, sustainable buildings and passive house, that that you're aligned, right? That that the, that's not going to be something that's going to get tossed aside when there start to be some some budget concerns. That that that's a guiding principle of the project. Um, so having established sort of a, a a level playing field with 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 clients and builders and collaborators, you know, I really I consider the definition of architecture is really moving through really what I've defined as four principles, working from the site and sort of the big picture through this notion of shelter being protected from the elements, um, the notion of space, how, how a building is subdivided to spaces within and how they relate to each other. And lastly, what I call a moment, which is really a detail, you know, where things come together and, and do they come together in a, in a technically, you know, proficient way and do they come together in a beautiful way? And so these, these are kind of all the things that I try to bring to what I do. So like a lot of architects um, and a lot of people, you know, who just love construction, I was, as a, particularly as a younger practitioner, really drawn to steel and concrete. I mean, it's incredibly rewarding, you know, to work with. It's visually appealing. It's fun, you know, to see stuff get built. And so a lot of, of my early and, and, and not so recent, but earlier projects really utilized uh, concrete and steel in addition to wood, but it's really space defining and, and, and an integral um, component, and you end up with you know these spaces that are really, are really articulated and get their architectural character from the materials that they're made of, and so, you know that's great and that was great and um, but then you know sometime around two thousand three happened to coincide with the birth of you know my kids and having a family. Your you know your point of view shifts a little bit. And so on this screen, because there's just not enough time to acknowledge all the people I've been able to learn from and work with and collaborate with, you know, I sort of began this journey of, of educating myself on sustainability, on notions of how, how sustainability works with an economy, 
on uh, on different different modes of construction on carbon sequestration. So here is just a summary of of uh, books that I've read that I find really important over the years. Um, obviously, passive house certification, education, uh, builders that I've worked with, and consultants. You know, uh, mechanical engineers, um, passive house consultants. So. This is just a quick shout out to 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 all of those people that have really helped me, you know, get to to a point where, you know, I just feel like I'm I'm I continue to learn. Um, so the the first step in in really jumping in was I I jumped into panelization sort of big time thanks to you know working with uh, Eco Core early on, um, New Energy Works have done I mean certainly more than these but these are all examples of panelized single family houses that I've that I've done over the years and really learned a lot from not just in terms of how you need to rethink how you design a building to optimize the process of panelization, but what does it mean for schedule? What does it mean for site disturbance? Uh, what does it mean for diagnostics? Uh, and, and what does it mean for how a project can really become um, didactic, that it can educate everybody who works on it? So even though you're working on a single family house, it's kind of this, you know, this drop in, uh, you know, you get these concentric ripples of education that that filter out through trades, through builders, through people who visit the project, and that's a real opportunity when you're making, you know, any kind of building. From, you know, from there, like a lot of us, um, my interest really evolved into uh, embodied carbon and and carbon sequestration, and I I started working, you know, with, trying to eliminate the amount of foam that occurred certainly above ground on projects and to, to what extent I can below ground. And there's, we all know there's, there's more and more progress on that, but these are just examples over the last several years of, of introducing wood fiber into projects and, you know, seeing, seeing and, and learning from that. So with, with that kind of basis, I'm going to jump in and talk about four projects that all, you'll see, you'll see these threads going through all of them. Um, so the first one is what I call the escarpment house. This is this is a new single family residence that's anticipated to be FIAS certified passive house. Uh, it's nearby in Saugerties, New York, and Ulster County. I mean, you can tell from these photos, it's an astonishing site. It's um it's it's uh it's it's an escarpment that's got a series of glacial boulders that are arrayed on this hillside. It's not an easy site to build on, but there was no way you were not going to put a house on this site that didn't establish some kind of dialogue with that kind of context and, and respected, you know, the way that the building sat in that landscape. Um, but it, but, you know, in terms of, of really in an integral way, thinking about how the building design would have evolved relative to the passive house path, relative to how the building would relate to the landscape. These are just some kind of mid early uh, notions of on the right, you see volumetric studies of the different spaces and how they kind of come together. But, you know, it, it's also for uh, calculation of treated area for the interior. And on the left early, um, looking at, at, right, you have two different kind of load paths within a building you have to consider, right? You have uniform loads, those are kind of easy and distributed and you have eccentric loads, particularly in a, in a non sort of, sort of in, a, in a more complicated building. And so very early on, we look at load paths, we go back and forth with structural engineers and try to look for economies and, and ways to simplify those eccentric moments. So in the end, um, you have a house that's largely rectilinear in form. It has a couple deformations, you know, where it's kind of looking to, to be in dialogue with the with the escarpment and with the with the glacial boulders that are nearby. But the game here is to make a simple, relatively simple building to build, meaning 90 degree corners, straightforward roof lines, but use the architecture and use those forms to begin to disguise that a little bit and come up with something that that begins to evolve and, and begins to evoke some of those stone forms that are nearby. So these are some some rendered views of the structure. And you can see, I mean, everything is is perpendicular and plumb, but by playing with uh, fascia angles and and different things. You 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 start to to play around with the roof form and it it doesn't read so rectilinear. Um, really important here too is uh, the notion of how this thing will be clad, particularly relative to the environment that it's sitting in. I'm fortunate to work uh, to have access to a um, uh, wood supplier that that really makes an effort to buy up um, what what are considered from an industry standpoint. Um, marginal uh, uh, quantities of wood, and in this case, uh, diseased ash, um, that we were able to work out a scheme to optimize 
the yield on that ash and come up with a rain screen siding solution that that we could pretty cost effectively, you know, relative to comparable products uh, used on this house. So this house will, will be entirely clad in, in diseased ash. Uh, I'm fortunate to be working with Holtram and, and New Energy Works on this. And so this is one of several sheets from the geometry review set that, that they put together to, you know, to talk about predictability, to really begin to understand, well, not to begin, to complete the understanding of how the building will be broken down into panels, uh, what the components are, um, what all the interfaces and details are going to be. These are, this is a, a cold roof system, so working through you know, not just the fact that it's going to be vented, but how is it going to be vented? How are those panels going to be manufactured with reveals for vent channels relative to siding? We went through all of that. And so this is just this is just one sheet, you know, that's from that path. Um, at the same time, one of the, on the predictability front, having done a fair number of, of uh, panelized buildings, one of the frustrations is, okay, you establish the volume, you have a set of you know, 2D plans of your HVAC system, but you go to implement it and you run into issues, you know, you're not, it's it's just a planning thing. So this was the first project where I was really able to, to build a pretty good 3D model of the HVAC system that was pretty well vetted. Um, uh, thanks, to, thanks to John Mitchell at uh, Building Type and, and sort of worked this through and was able to share it with Holtram so they could they could pull it into their model and we were able to identify every penetration and we we did it with electrical too so anything that's going to make a penetration through the walls those panels are going to be fabricated anticipating those so we're going to i'll never say eliminate but we're going to minimize having to make any modifications to panels in the field and this is where the, this is a drone view of the, of the site right now that's an overlay of the of the uh, building sitting on the site to the north is up and to the west you can see we've got We've got gravel sitting there, so this will be my first project using a foam glass aggregate for both, you know, the compacted subbase and, and the insulative layer. So we're pretty close, with the possible exception of the slab edges. Uh, we wanted to use mineral wool, but relative to the R value that I was seeking, I think we're going to use EPS. But we're we're getting pretty low on how much foam. Um, you know, we're not not at no foam yet, but we're getting close. Um, Slightly different direction now. I want to talk a little bit about cost predictability. So this is a sketch for a new house that I'm in, probably in the middle of design development for right now on a beautiful site uh, here in Woodstock. And one of the real frustrations that I think we probably all share is, is cost projection, the units that we use for cost projection, right? Everybody talks about cost per square foot. Cost per square foot is, you know, is a metric that ages super quickly, right? Uh, uh, I'm not going to say any of the numbers because we all know what they are. And but but the point is that uh, whatever cost per square foot was two, three, four, five years ago, that doesn't really transfer, right? How do you make those adjustments over time to be able to lead a client and and uh, work with a client and and manage their expectations about what a project's going to cost? You know, like a lot of architects, you go through a process and you get you you finish the drawings and you go out for bids or you get final pricing and you're over budget. And you have to go back and go through the painful process of you know reworking the building to get to a place where everyone's comfortable. So I started thinking about this and thinking there's got to be another way. And so this is very much a hypothesis, but I'm going to share it. Um, so with one of the nice things about about panelization and one of the nice things about um, having a lot of data, which I do, because I I. Like I, I track, you know, obviously the final, the actuals on, on cost on all the projects and I keep that so I can use it for reference. But in the, at the end of schematic design, when I've got floor plans, I've got elevations, I've got isometric views and I've got a door and window schedule. I really have enough information to start getting some cost feedback. I can't price the entire project, but I could get a door and window quote. I could get a foundation quote. I could get, I could get a shell, a, a panelized shell quote. So don't try to read the numbers here. What I want to talk about here is the structure. What this is, is, is this is a, a way that I'm trying to think about components of a project as being a percentage of the total cost. The problem with dollars is they age, as I said, right? They're not a reliable unit over time. What's reliable, at least for me, is data. So what you see in this, in this chart is uh, divisions roughly based on uh, Construction Specification Institute, common divisions that you're going to see 
a, a, a building contract broken down in terms of the components of a project. These are actuals. These are five projects that I've completed. And then I've gone through and broken them down based on these components. What I'm looking, and then, and these are average, right? Average costs. And from those costs, I'm pulling, what's the average percentage of that component of the full cost of the house, right? How much, what percentage is HVAC of that? What percentage is, is doors and windows? And the cool thing about that is within an Excel environment is you can go ahead and you can, you can pull one number, uh, doors and windows or, or panels. You can plug that in and the rest of the estimate's gonna iterate. So instead of just saying, oh, it's uh, uh, X dollars per square foot times uh, 2,800 square feet, and that's not a reliable number. Now I have another basis to come up with another path for a cost projection. We're, um, and I'm in the middle of doing this on this one project and you know I'll let you know in a couple of weeks, but so far it's very helpful for conversations about costs and it's super helpful to, be, to just see a, a different understanding that uses a unit other than dollars. Enough about that. So um, another project, this is a, a sustainable subdivision that's here in Woodstock. It's a really interesting project and it was an opportunity not just to provide clients with some nice houses, but to really learn some stuff and see about you know what 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 we could glean and 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 bring to projects going forward in the future. And it's really about we're talking about three houses for three families on a subdivided thirty acre lot. Um, a, again, a beautiful site. I'm very lucky for the kind of projects that I get to work on on these sites. Thirty acre site with a delineated wetland. Uh, I participated in the subdivision so that we could really place the houses pretty thoughtfully. Obviously, staying away from the wetland, taking advantage of some in, uh, existing logging roads, things like that. But the goal was, you know, budget is, is always a thing. And so it was gonna come down to how do we look at the benefits of repetition? And by that, I mean, building three houses at the same time versus differentiation. Where can the houses depart from each other in order for them to represent the particular needs of a family? And how do we, how do we manage that equation? Um, so these are these are just renderings. I'm sorry, I went too fast. These are renderings of the three houses. They're basically the same core house. They're differentiated by whether they have a carport, a garage, where the screen porches are placed. I mean, they all have the same you know relationship to the sun. They all take advantage of of, of the site features. But you know, it's this cusp of trying to understand um, you know where are we going to benefit from repetition and and where, where can we step out a little bit. Um, again, it's a pretty simple house form, um, rectangular, uh, really simple rectangular floor plan, rectangular uh, double height space, you know, where the stair is. The garage is isolated, obviously, from a performance standpoint and from an air ceiling standpoint with a breezeway that connects them. Um, simple shed roofs, you know, monoslopes, uh, exposure for solar. So, um, absolutely consistent enclosure types. You know, the cladding might be different, but everything behind the cladding is gonna be the same, whether it's the roof. Uh, we're looking at a, a haunch slab. These are pretty flat sites. So again, we'll be using a foam glass aggregate foundation with, with uh, haunch slabs. Um, and I like to do these isometrics just for, for clarification of, of what all the components are. So once we had established these, um, we start to look at, we come to this crossroads. Are we going to panelize these or are we going to stick build them? This is a really good opportunity to look at, 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 uh, at what's called system optioneering. I had the really good fortune to cross paths with Brian Hopkins at Har uh, Hopkins Architect Plus, and Brian's developed a, uh, what, he, what he called the Build Plus platform that integrates uh, a, a 3D BIM model, uh, which, which directly accesses um, quantities and, and areas for, for cost estimating relative to local values for labor, material costs, and then of course, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, iterates a schedule. So what you have is this three dimensional thing that you can incorporate all this information in and begin to get like a really integrated view of a project. And, but we got to this crossroads where we really needed to understand, uh, we, need, we needed to make a recommendation to the client, are we gonna stick build these or are we gonna panelize them? So it's not as straightforward an analysis as you think, because in my experience, if you're going to panelize or if you're going to stick build, you're not necessarily going to use the same kind of systems, right? The way you would approach a stick build pro uh, 
project and the way the layers are going to go and how many times you want to have to go around the building. I mean, it's one of the reasons that panelizing is a great solution. But what we did is we had to be pretty academic about it. We, we took what we considered to be a fairly, uh, cons uh, I don't want to say standard, but a, a, a panel assembly that, that I found fairly consistent across a number of manufacturers and mirror that in a stick framed application. And then Brian was able to build a model to understand from a uh, cost standpoint, particularly in terms of labor and material for the stick framing, where do we end up? I'm um, just gonna jump to the chase. And again, this is on the basis of three houses. So we found that panelization in this case would, would bring us a savings of about 7% for the three houses. That's not insignificant on the scale of, you know, the millions of dollars that we're talking about. But equally, we're projecting conservatively a, a two month um, reduction in the term of the project. And we all know that carrying costs on a project, you know, month to month, I mean, uh, a house could cost the same thing, but if it takes you three years to build it or two years to build it, that, the, that those carrying costs for every month, that, that costs money. So on that basis, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna proceed with panelization. Um, so my point here is just to is to show you the ways that I'm experimenting with what you know ways to really understand how to make good recommendations to clients, how to get the most you know for the dollar, and how to look for predictability in these situations. Lastly, uh, I'm super interested and intrigued by what a, a, a carbon um, embodied carbon calculation uh, program like Beam offers, and I've just started playing around with it. So I profess no expertise whatsoever. Um, I've tried it on a couple different projects and I ran this the other day and uh, a lot of you were probably better at reading the results than me, but I like seeing a line here under great. That, that makes me happy. Um, and so what it's telling me, and when, when you look at this, is just the results page, if you're familiar with the program, and some of it's kind of obvious, but obviously roof and exterior walls are, you know, are sequestering carbon at a pretty big rate, cellulose, dense pack insulation, et cetera, all those wood-based uh, and then you can look at your worst defenders, right? So um, we're kind of midway through this project. We haven't started construction yet, so I can still I can still get feedback from here, right? I'm looking at windows, things like that, to see where I can where I can make adjustments. So anyway, just a little bit about that and how that begins to have a footprint in the project. Um, I'm going to go really quickly through just the notion of taking these same principles and looking at how they can, you can begin to take the dividends from learning. Like most of my work is, is high end single family houses, but I'm, I'm looking to see how I can, can take what I'm learning and apply it in different areas. Like a lot of towns, Woodstock where I live, you know, there's a serious affordable housing deficit. And so I got involved with an organization called the Woodstock Housing Alliance that's seeking to change that. And the gist of the issue is we have mid rise high density and we have single family homes like a lot of towns. And the solution lies in what's called middle housing. And this is a great book if you're interested in this, where you look at a, a different degree of recombinations of connected units that will lend themselves, they're very flexible, they can find, you can easily use them on different sites. And it's a really good vehicle for, for solving this or, or beginning to address the affordable housing uh, issue. So what we did in this case is started by, by utilizing uh, passive house assemblies and the notion of offsite fabrication to design a series of modules, uh, a studio, a one bedroom, a two bedroom, a three bedroom. Um, the intent is to have a compacted wet wall. So that could even be something that could be fabricated uh, to anticipate that uh, um, uh, modular kitchens and, and bathrooms and really looking for components that, that, that you know, can, can be repeated in these units. And then the tricky thing is you, how you recombine them and how you put them on sites. Now, a quick aside here, I like a lot of towns, everybody likes to talk about housing. Everybody at the same time are super concerned about change. Um, Woodstock is, a, is an artist colony, as a lot of you might know. And one of the really important things about how you begin to talk about buildings is how you represent them. So what I did is I went back and looked at the, the kind of a history of Woodstock art, the way buildings were represented in the landscape. Um, and looked for looked for um, influence there, and looked for inspiration there, and and utilized that to begin the process of talking about how, about these buildings. Right there's the technical side, and obviously there's the aesthetic side. And then I I sort of came up with a series of of types. Right, so here you see a duplex or a quad of studios, and then I set them into sort of a context to begin to understand the way they would fit in the landscape. You need 
it's really important to make these buildings feel recognizable to people, not sort of alienated, you know, renderings, but but something that they they can relate to the way they live. Um, this is a, a stacked hybrid version, right? This this has one bedroom, two bedroom studios, you know, all within the form of a pretty compact, uh, dense building, but still one that feels recognizable in this in this area. Um, the townhouse version, where you have you could have several different size units, but they add up, um, you know, to front a street and have a differentiated backyard and still add up to something kind of architectural. Um, and uh, these are all um, conceptual, right? These are just to have a, uh, a library of solutions um, that so when sites become available or we're able to begin a project, we have a, a language, we have a toolkit to use. This is what they call a, a mansion type where you, you aggregate a series of units, but it sort of adds up to a larger building that, you know, that, that, that could feel like a larger single family house sitting in, in, a, in the context of other single family houses. And then the the courtyard type, you know, uh, goes without saying. So, I also just wanted to take just to push it a little further. Applied these principles to an ADU. There was a local competition in Kingston. And I wanted to try it out for that. So, you know, how's it made? You know, you can end up with a a, a very minimal concrete foundation with a foam glass aggregate, a panelized construction, simple truss roof. Uh, renewables and you know pretty efficient kind of structure. So this is a little bit of a archetype for the way the um, the affordable housing units could go if we have the opportunity to build some. I'm going to end on a completely different note. Um, so what's so a folly, right? Historically, a folly is is and these are all examples of a, an architect has the good fortune to have a patron or a client that says, yeah, I just I want to build something. Um, it doesn't really have a purpose. And, and historically, architects use that as an opportunity to pursue something that they're super interested in. And so it, in the end, the client gets their building and they get, they get their solution, but it's an opportunity to really develop um, uh, some knowledge. So I had a, a great client, have a great client that I was able to do this addition to an existing house and bring it up to a, a high performance Level was the first project that I used wood fiber insulation on. And it's got this great, um, this is the a view of the site. Here's the site plan. And over to the east of the property, they have some high ground. From that high ground, they have a view of the Hudson River. So I want to put a building up there. I want to put a structure up there so we, because just so we get those views. And so here's the site. Here you can just make out the Catskill Mountains looking west from the site, uh, a view up the site. And the fern leaf, which is you know kind of the prominent ground cover that occurs there, and these were really the inspirations for the building. So you can see uh, the roof form that kind of evokes that sort of fern leaf, an absolutely minimal foundation, so that it sits on a small uh, crawl space that's just going to allow it to bring utilities up into the structure. It's it's going to be a studio like a home office, and it's uh, I'll show you some more three D images in, is in a minute. It's an absolutely, you know, by intent, it's, an, it's a more organic form and it's entirely built of wood with the, the minimization of, uh, of concrete. Um, it'll be a CLT structure entirely with a exterior insulation, wood, you know, wood fiber of various thicknesses sitting on these, on these glue lamps. Um, and I, I ran a beam calc on this and it was interesting. And again, I'm, I'm really uh, a novice with this. But what you know, what you'll find is in, until until there's more data on harvest, sustainable harvesting, what absolutely what the wood source is. Um, I was disappointed by the payback I was getting, uh, not relative to steel. But my point is only that um, I made this an all wood structure, and it's still not doing as well as I hope it does. And I'm, I have to I have to do some more uh, uh, in depth analysis of this. But this is an all wood structure, and there's still challenges in terms of of bringing uh, embodied carbon down relative to you know where you source. Excuse me, that information. And here's some views of it again using a sustainably harvested uh, siding, you know, in a pattern that evokes that inspiration, and uh, some three D views of it. And these are just a quick view of the shop drawings of the CLTs. This one will be going up uh, in about two months, so if you're an Instagram person, you'll you'll see it on my Instagram hopefully. And there's a rendering of it. And that's it. These are some houses that I've done recently that I think imbue all these principles. 
fantastic, Barry. Really, really beautiful presentation. Did I go too fast? No, not okay. at all. You, I all think right. you hit the mark perfectly. All right. Good. Yeah. And Do you want me to keep my screen up or you want me to unshare? Uh, you can keep it up for a moment. Yeah. I think it's great. Uh, okay. These are all such beautiful projects. And I like the story arc of how to incorporate the things that matter to people most into your design practice. And it, it, it's nice because you're using your vast experience, it looks to me like, to remain a student. And um, I feel like you just mentored all of us <laughs> on how to, how to incorporate what matters most into our workflows. So thank you very much for that. My pleasure. Yeah. And we have lots of great questions. But right. first, we're going to thank our sponsors, and then we will come back. Indeed. And I actually may need to, to ask you to unshare just for a second, Barry. Yeah, sure. All right. Awesome. Thank you. So, um, and Barry, that was amazing. Thanks so much for being here today and for your sure. excellent presentation. So I want to just take a quick moment to thank all the fine organizations that help make our work at Passive House Accelerator possible. So a big thank you to our stakeholder partner, NYSERDA, the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority. Thank you too to our founding sponsors. 475 High Performance Building Supply, Ingui Architecture, Glavel, Minotaur, Partel, Rockwell North America, Stocorp, and Zola Windows. Thanks too to our champion sponsors, Boizo, Gradient, Icon Windows and Doors, Intelligent Membranes, PH Air Seal, and Source 2050. And thank you to our patron sponsors, Brennan Brennan, Brennan Euroline Windows, Holstrom System, Innotech Windows and Doors, Lamalux, Longboard, RDH Building Science, and Sanderson Sustainable Design. Thank you, sponsors. Thanks, Zach. Thanks to all I just uh, wanted to chime in real quick and just say how amazing your work is, Barry, because when I first started out in Passive House, the things that you're using, like gravel, uh, you know, wood fiber insulation, wasn't really available. It had to come from Europe. And now where we are today, those both of those products are made not too far away on the East Coast here. Um, uh, so, And then seeing how you're now ev evolving even more and using CLT, which was 10 years ago was thought of like, oh, that's really hard to get. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's out there in the Pacific Northwest. Transport isn't that. And to see that you're using it, just amazing. And that these projects are high performance and your your network of high performance suppliers and consultants is, is amazing. And uh, keep up the great work, my friends. Thank you. Nice presentation. Totally, Kevin. I second that. And I specifically love that you use that reclaimed diseased local ash wood you know so many of us on the east coast here are feeling the the loss of those trees and it's sad to see people burning them because they think that's the only way to get rid of you know the problem um, yeah. and it's wonderful to see it being reclaimed and used as the siding for the project yeah, it's a great opportunity, really. When you have the right people that, you know, that are willing to warehouse them and 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 machine them, you know, effectively, then it's possible. And I mean, hardwood siding, you know, go figure. Yeah, <laughs> go figure. Like they did it back in the day. Yeah. I think, uh, we've got a few questions and we'll start okay. off with Carlos Cardosa. Carlos, would you like to unmute and ask your question? And Carlos, if you are challenged to unmute, I can ask it for you. But it looks like you're here and you're unmuted. Yep, I got it. Thanks. <laughs> um, Barry, just wanted to know what software you're actually using to um, to design your, your projects and then do all the calculations that you're doing. Well, the, the uh, I use Vectorworks for all my 2D and 3D. It's the only, the only software that I use, uh, other than the things that I mentioned, obviously, for, for calculation, uh, um, and then it's it's really exporting, you know, for whether I'm working with a, a panel fabricator that's using CAD works or you know something right. like that. So, but my core my core work I use I use Vectorworks, and I've you know there, it it works pretty well to export and import from most different formats. Great, thank you. Sure. 
Thanks, Carlos. Next up, we have Chris S. from North Andover. Uh, hi, thanks for that great presentation. Um, sure. I'm wondering if you've heard of um, Sublime offering a 90% reduction in um, embodied carbon for uh, cement. And if you are, then when might it be available for your project? Because you're definitely at that level. <laughs> yeah, I, what I would say about it, I'm I'm fairly hip to what's going on with uh, with concrete and admixtures and Sublime, among others. But for sure, as a leader, it it comes down to to me and the builders that I'm working with doing the work with local concrete suppliers and you know getting those those mixes so that they're available locally. That's it's not a matter of the stuff is out there and the work is being done. It's getting it implemented. You know, I, I, I ran into the same things with wood fiber early on. Uh, people were nervous about it. Oh, it costs a little more to get it, you know, things like that. So it's an implementation issue, I think. Um, so I'm super interested in it. Um, the problem is that I don't think alone I do enough work to really, you know, leverage a, a local supplier, but it's, but that's, that's the next thing that has to happen. So certainly some, something to work on and I plan to. Could I ask about uh, the HVAC system if hydronic was con considered? I pretty, pretty well default to, to heat pump systems um, on, on almost all of these projects by hydronic, you mean a boiler based unit? Uh, there are air to water heat pumps. Uh, so it's just the distribution side. I thought I saw just duct work. Yeah. So, but the uh, radiant floors, for example. Yeah. I, I'm, I mean, my sort of presupposition is that I'm going to be holding, if I do my work right, I'm going to hold temperature and I'm going to be protecting for, for uh, passive gain. So I kind of, ra ra I'm, I'm, I'm not doing a whole lot of radiant. I'm really trying to keep it simple. And generally, generally, depending on the size and proportion of the space, if I can do a ducted heat pump, you know, we can control the distribution of air, you know, a little better than cassettes. But depending on the on the spaces, you know, and, and the economy, we'll look at cassettes. But I don't want to say I've moved away from hydronic, but I do a whole lot less of it than I have in the past. Great questions, Chris. Thank you for those. Uh, I had a question for you, Barry, about, yeah. um, you know, it was nice to see you moving from your typical design to then form factors, foam free and then starting that process where you're using BEAM to do the carbon calculations. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about that and how much time it, it takes to do that, even though it's in its infancy in your design flow. And then, um, um, well, after that, I'd love to hear more about the subdivision part of the uh, sustainable sub, uh, subdivision development. I mean, I, I found Beam to be fairly intuitive to use. Um, you know, it's in more, it's in a Google Sheets format. Um, you know, it's, they offer a tutorial and if I weren't, so uh, I don't want to use the word lazy, but I just kind of went right for it. Um, and I found it pretty easy to use in terms of inputs. And, you know, in the end you get your results and you can tell if something's wrong. And so you go back through, but, Essentially, um, I found it really easy to use. I think to do one of those houses in the subdivision, it may have taken me an hour and a half um, between, it depends. If you've already done your energy calcs and you have all your quantities sort of written down already, then it's pretty easy because you're just trans, you know, you're transposing. If you're going from, you know, just a model on your screen and you have to quantify things, it, it, it I found it super fast really. And, and the best thing about it really is, you really want to jump on it early, not you know, not when you're through construction documents because it's it's never too late, but it's pretty late. So I I found it, and I and you know I was being pretty transparent in the presentation. I was disappointed by my results on that last building relative to my goals, and so you know I I actually have an email into them to ask them a little bit more about timber, and maybe I'm not doing something right, you know. But I do think it comes down, and they say right in their in their declarations or their um, in the manual that there's you know timber relies so much on on how it's harvested, the locality, and and how sustainably that goes. So I'm um, I'm hopeful for that, and it doesn't change what my intent for the building is at all. I just hoped when I did the calculations that I was going to see a lot more benefit compared to say a you know a wide flange or something like that. 
Absolutely. And I love to hear that you're already pushing on yourself and, and checking in with them to see how you can evolve that and, and tighten it up. Yeah, it's a cool tool. It's a really cool tool. Yeah, I like it too. I haven't I haven't used it completely yet for a project though, but I've I've dabbled. Um, when you did the subdivision, um, yeah, is it often that you get to get involved that early? No in project. No. And then when when you had the opportunity, what were the big things you were thinking about? I mean, obviously you're thinking about exposure and passive house and you know free heat. You got muted. Shannon, I accidentally muted you. I'm so sorry. Oh, oh that's okay. Thanks. Thanks. I just missed the last part of the question. Uh, I was asking, obviously, you're thinking about exposure, free heat, free cooling, but were you thinking about water as well or any other big subjects, erosion? Um, yeah. Subjects? I mean, the, the biggest issue what the biggest issue was the um the wetland, right? And so you have a you have 30 acres, about half of it's kind of unbuildable. Um, so fortunately, you know, based on other factors, you know, the owners and I were on the same page in terms of the degree of site disturbance that, that we were willing to impose. And then it really just came down to what are the best building sites? Um, they all had uniform exposure. You know, I walked the site with an arborist to understand the kind of the generations of the trees, which ones are going to do well, which ones aren't going to do well, which ones, you know, rely on the others in, in order to, to do well. Um, so it's just kind of a 360 on the site and and then and having clients that are supportive. And, and you know, the funniest thing is clients who were willing to have lots that were different sizes. They didn't all have to be the same size. They were willing to have them, be, you know, in order to, to respect the wetlands and get things proportioned properly. So it, I'd never done a subdivision before. So it was a pretty interesting process. Thank you. Sean, it looks like you're up next. Yeah. Uh, Barry, again, amazing presentation. I wanted to kind of dive into some of those beam calculations because on a yeah. recent per in Vancouver, um, one of the team actually made a decision to make smaller windows with double pane windows than larger triple pane um, just because of that embodied carbon conversation. Yeah. I'm just wondering if your clients have tried to like look at that given that concrete steel glass and solar panels is kind of like the top four when it comes to the embodied carbon and and uh and again like never was on my radar until we started to play around with beam and and seeing some of the data and being like okay well if we do go 10 percent smaller in size there's a cost uh savings to that but then you're also potentially lowering the embodied carbon and i'm just wondering if you've thought and try to consider Another calculation in that massive spreadsheet of, of data that you've been working in all your projects. I mean, it's it's ridiculous how resourceful uh, you are in the data that you showed here. But just wondering if if that's another angle you've also started to consider in your design developments. Yeah, it it is for sure. I mean, because it's maybe one of the most important, right? Um, so I haven't gotten my arms around it yet, honestly, Sean. I I I've been staring at Beam for I think I I think I donated a year and a half ago. And you know, finally got got to use it. And I and that last project I showed is the one that I wanted to start with. And I, but I, um, all I can tell you is no, I haven't had conversations with the clients yet because the data is honestly pretty fresh. Um, yeah. Okay. But it did. Um, my head is spinning a little bit from it. That's the only thing I can tell you. Gotcha. I mean, in, well, again, in the same I'm, way that in the same way that you're saying that you would begin to revisit assumptions based on some of the data that you got. And that it might yeah. force you to redirect, you know, in terms of uh, of recommendations. And I'll help out your question too. I know that you're talking with Chris Magwood and the team at Beam about uh, the the mass timber conversations. I'll ask all the manufacturers here at the mass timber conference of their EPDs and and trying to understand how uh, how they're giving Chris and the team at at Beam the data so that they can uh, give us better info on your uploads. Yeah, that would so be great. I'll I'd love to know. That. I'd love to know that. Thank you. That's a perfect example of how this community works. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Sean. And thank you, Barry. Uh, Barry, for, for those who are still trying to convince their clients to build Passive House, if your client doesn't know what it is and, and you don't think they want to get terribly engaged or involved or understand as much about it as maybe some clients do, 
What's the first question you ask them? What's the question that gets them over the hump? I know, I know for me, it's, have you done an energy model? Or will you consider a feasibility study for, you know, fewer solar panels and going off grid? Well, I think it, it's changed over time. I mean, if you look, I showed a slide early on on my website. And the first thing, when you open my website, it says climate crisis. And, and so the whole, the whole point there is, okay, let's get that. Let's get that out in the open now and see if we're aligned in terms of this is something that matters to you. If it doesn't matter to you, then I'm not your architect, right? That's like, so, so that, that takes half of that, that eliminates half the conversation right there. When I, when I started out, um, when I became familiar with Passive House and when I wondered from a business standpoint, can I sustain my business doing them? Um, what I found was if somebody called you and said they wanted to build a Passive House, a client, they probably knew more about it than you did already, right? As a, and, and so that was going to be easy. And actually, I had the opportunity to work with a company called Harmony Builders who were, they were way ahead for me. And I actually did my first passive house as their architect kind of coming along for the ride. And so I learned on that, you know, in that situation. And that was for me, that was a real um, springboard to be able to do the projects. So to answer your question though, I think once it's established that we're aligned, I think the, you know, clients are looking to us for expertise. Um, some of them want to go deep into the details. Some of them don't at all. Right. And so you could approach it two ways. You could be open about it and say, this is what I'm going to do. And this is what the benefits going to be to you. And some are interested and some are less interested, or you could just say, Hey, this is the way that I design. This is how we build. It's not really, this is going to sound super arrogant. It's not really like this, but it's not negotiable. Right. So are you cool with it? Um, and it's a much deeper and much more layered conversation than that. But of I don't course, know if I'm answering yes. your question, but that's kind of how I go about it. Absolutely. Um, and we'll, we can jump back into that if there's time. Um, we are getting close to the end of the first hour, but I think we have time for one more question okay. before we jump into events. So Eric Bosley, are you with us? And would you like to unmute and ask your question? Uh, sure. Welcome. Uh, thanks. So, yeah, I was just, I noticed you mentioned glass foam aggregate a few times, and I don't know if I missed something, but I just wanted to see if you could talk a little more about it. When I, when I looked into it, when you have to add sand for structural stability, it seemed like it kind of wiped out versus recycled, recycled concrete aggregate with just uh, recycled rigid foam on top. Well, uh, the point, the point for me was to have no foam, right, for starters. So the, the appeal of the foam glass is that it's insulative and, and basically structural at the same time. So generally when I'm working on an undisturbed site, I'm gonna be able to establish um, uh, an, an undisturbed substrate you know, pretty easily. And, yep. and, and, and yeah, maybe we might put some lifts of something on top of that, some crushed stone or something just to, just to, to level it off. But then, uh, we're going to get, I think, 18 inches of, of gravel underneath this one house, you know, compacted, ready to go. It's going to provide both the drainage layer and the insulative layer. The, the, the only issue that I'm finding is you can't backfill against your haunch slab edge with it. So you're looking at, if you want to go foam free, you're looking, and this is my understanding, other people might know different. You're looking at mineral wool for a slab edge insulation, or you're looking at, you know, obviously the usual suspects, EPS or something like that. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Amazing. Um, I'm going to ask Caroline's question for her because she reached out in the chat and asked if I could do that. So Caroline Stark asks, can you please show the 3D model of the last project again? Looks impressive. So I imagine that is the ADU project she's talking about. And uh, it's that wasn't the last one. Oh, that wasn't the last one. Okay. But... If she's there, she can tell me. Let yeah, me Carolyn, just... if you're listening, please drop it in the chat, which one you meant. That was the last one. Oh, okay. And that's not an ADU. No, that's not. Well, it could be. but <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite project. I love the fern leaf inspiration. It's 
fantastic. I'm pretty excited about it, you know, it getting built for sure. Yeah, and I love the way that you've inverted the grain for the siding to reflect the way those leaves look. It's really, really beautiful, Barry. Yeah, it should be cool. Thank you. Sure. So yes. our next question up is from Mo. Mo, would you like to come on and ask your question? Looks like you're still here. If not, I can ask it for you. Mo asks, uh, he says, this is more like a comment. I was surprised to see your HVAC cost is higher than electrical. Is this common in your projects? Well, yeah. Yeah, um, <laughs> in, an answer, in a word. <laughs> uh, they're complicated. And one of the one of the tricks is, and that's where client education you know, here's an example. Um, I want a 1200 uh, uh, CFM Van Hood, you know, I want a professional kitchen and we try to keep them, you know, 400, 600 at the outside, right? Anything we can do if we can to avoid a makeup air unit. So minute, the minute you start stepping outside those boundaries, then all your, all your peripheral costs are gonna go up, right? Your, H, your HVAC, your, now you've got a makeup air unit, um, we're finding, and this is a whole other chapter, and I, my, my engineers and consultants could say more about this, but humidification, dehumidification, these are all factors that are a little bit outside to some extent. And again, I'm not an, an MEP engineer, um, but you know what the heat pump units can handle, particularly with the, with you know the hotter and hotter summers. So yeah, I'm finding HVAC is expensive and complicated. Thanks, Barry. I uh, couldn't agree more. Uh, finding someone not only who can design it for a passive house and keep you in the low loads that you're specifying, uh, and then finding the installer. And uh, depending upon if you're certifying, if uh, you have an installer who is certified as well. Um, how many of your projects do you certify? Uh, what percentage? Not as many as I would like. Um, <clears throat> percentage it's a small percentage to tell you the truth uh so far i've only done two but i i always the principles are always there the diagnostics are always there the testing is always there to be to be really candid about it i like i like certification particularly when i'm working with a builder that hasn't done a passive house before because it really becomes an opportunity for training. Um, and then I, I ask the owner, because the builder works for the owner, to I ask the owner and the builder if, they, if they'll get somebody trained for the project. And then depending on the complexity of the project, we'll seek certification to really hold that as a friendly lever over the project to make sure everything is done. But what you, what you get in the end, I mean, it's the client's dime, you know, the, to pay for consultants and pay for some of the peripheral costs and there's there's costs associated with it um but you get an opportunity to educate a lot of people and yeah and you you know you you guarantee the performance of the project but we're getting good results i, I would certify every project if i could i just can't always get um the buy in sometimes i'll eat the fees you know within my fee to get it done so it depends on the project that's such a thoughtful answer. I really appreciate that. And I think it's a great piece of advice for everybody out there. Um, who is next? Keith Green. Hi, Keith. Hey, Shannon. Barry, thanks a lot for your presentation. Um, this sure. question probably feeds directly off your answer to the last one. Yeah. I'm curious, um, you shared a lot of the uh, software that you use, you know, CAD and, and analysis software. Do you ever get involved with the PHPP directly, or is that dependent on certification and whether you hire a you know certification consultant? The answer is I want to, but at the same time, um, I I I rely pretty heavily on the consultants that I'm working on to run the PHPPs. When I did my training, I made a pretty bold you know obviously I had to understand it enough to be able to to pass the test and and understand it and be be um, facile with it. Um, uh, so I've been interested in, in getting, you know, the, the more I can know it, the better, you know, woofy, uh, therm, all these things are things that I want to do, but I've made the difficult decision to keep my 
you know, to, to rely on others in the spirit of collaboration to keep other people busy. And because I think it brings some objectivity, you know, to the project to get a different point of view when somebody else is looking at it. Otherwise, I'm going to keep finding the answer that I want to find, you know. And do you export uh, to your consultant? And is, is that, have you found any problems? Obviously not. Vectorworks to, uh, for them to do a 3D takeoff? No, no, I haven't. Because um, I can, I can export to a variety of formats. It's, it's usually a little trial and error to get the one you know, that, that works best for whatever software they're using. Sometimes I might make more of a simplified model. It might take me a little while just to eliminate a lot of data and a lot of information that they don't need so I can send them something that's super simple and not too heavy. But generally speaking, the cross-platform stuff is okay. Great question. Thank you, Keith. Next question up is from Eric, Eric R. Eric, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Looks like you're staying on mute, so I'll ask it for you. He mentioned that he noticed you use sonotube type footings frequently and asks, do you ever look at helical piles or yeah. is it just simpler uh, to use concrete for everything as long as the truck comes to the site anyway? No, I, I have a fair amount of experience with helical piers. Um, I worked on a project near the Hudson River uh, and we had to go down, I think almost 30 feet, you know, to get to a consistent sub base just because of, you know, the sedimentation that occurs next to the river. Um, and helical, helicals were great, you know, because you can just telescope as you go. Can you, and, and we went in because we were, we were looking to make it a low impact solution. So the idea of just bringing a bobcat on site and being able to drill the piers was really cool. The issue with them is lateral loads. So um, you could you can do helicals all day long, but something has to transfer that load, you know, at grade to keep the building from swaying at the foundation level. In my experience, so even when even when I have used them, sometimes I've had to make concrete caps or a grade beam to tie them together um, for decks all the time. Uh, I've never done a whole building on helical piers. I would love to. The other issue that we find here is because there's a lot of a lot of ledge. There's a lot of situations where they just aren't going to work. Yep, I've I've had to rule them out because of the rock as well at times. But thank yeah. you. And and really interesting to hear about the way you use the gray beams in combination with them for the laterals. That's super cool. Mm -hmm. All right, a last question up today is from Ben. Hi, Ben. You can hear me. Go ahead and unmute. And if not, I'll ask your question for you. Oh, it looks like you just left the room. Okay. He wanted to hear if the HVAC design on one of the slides was designed by you, Barry. No, I don't. Nope. I don't design I, any HVAC. I rely on a couple different. I, I I I rely on a couple different people who were in that slide early on. You mentioned building type, right? Building type and and Bowcraft are, are um, yeah. I'm working with another company now too. I have enough projects that I have to spread the love around a little bit, but um, <laughs> but I've worked with Kramer and Bowcraft for since the beginning, really. So, but no, I don't design any of them myself. I don't have that expertise, and and uh, I don't want that liability. Yeah, and especially when someone's asking for more than six hundred cfm on that cooktop hood. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I only know enough about HVAC to be dangerous. Fair enough. Thank you, Barry. And thanks to everyone for coming today and spending your time with us. I know your time is short and you're probably getting back to work. So please reach out to Barry, connect with him on social media, check out the events, check out the podcast that just came out of the Nessie conference and look for us in Germany in a week. And Barry, please come back and see us again when Certainly. you're under construction on your next project and All right. hear more. Thanks again, Shannon. I really appreciate it. Our pleasure, Barry. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, you all. Thank you all for coming and the questions. Barry, I'll wrap up by just showcasing you all the mass timber here in Portland. But uh, hopefully one of these products will make it to your amazing project. You We're in the Vegan Timbers uh, mock-up. Let me turn the Vagen. And here you go. Look at all of those people. Sean, we've got your audio. Now we've got your video. Fantastic.
Thank you very much, Shannon. Wonderful presentation. And we'll be building a house in Palo Alto, which is passive, built with steel frame. Oh, great. Reach Thank out you. to us and share that with us. Thank you. Sure well. Thank you. Nice booth, Sean. That's a lot of sawdust. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Enjoy the rest of the day. <laughs> yeah. And Kevin, congratulations to you and Michael on the firehouse. It's looking really beautiful. Thanks. Thanks. It's a labor of love. Thank you, Barry. <laughs> Great presentation. And uh, see you guys. Thank you.